Welcome, dear children of Adam, to this long overdue video that goes over the first half of the Fallout Bible Installment 6. The Fallout Bible series is my attempt to synthesize the information contained in the Fallout Bible that was written over the course of many months by Chris Avalon, who worked on Fallout 2 and later Fallout New Vegas. He put a lot of effort into communicating with fans of the series in the early aughts and struck out to compile as much information as he could with the help of fans, focusing specifically on Fallout and Fallout 2, while also giving answers to questions that benefit greatly from his insider experience. This video contains a lot of information and makes for a great listen, but I will do my best to keep the visuals entertaining as well. I'll also be providing context for those that may have not played the early games, so that you don't get lost. Most critically, here to help me is Gray from Gray Gaming, who was kind enough to lend me his time and voice to better help break up the questions and answers. Gray is another Fallout YouTuber that, if you haven't seen his content, you need to check it out, but I'll let Gray explain it himself. Greetings Adams Faithful and what is up my homies, it is Gray from Gray Gaming here. I've had a ton of fun working on this collab with Rad, he's a stand-up guy and has actually helped me develop a number of skills which has improved the content on my own channel. Over at Gray Gaming we cover a pretty wide variety of Fallout topics, from settlement building in Fallout 4 to general lore and analyses that cover the entire spectrum of the Fallout universe. I'd love to see you over at Gray Gaming, but if that's not your cup of tea, I'll see you back here at Rad King. I have enormous respect for his settlement crafting abilities and creativity, because my settlement building skills come in two flavors, box and big box. I enjoy his non-settlement specific content as well, like the video about why Fallout 4 is the best Fallout for beginners. Show him some love and check out his channel by clicking the card or checking out the video description. I also want to thank Chris Avalon, who is not here to lend me his talent or voice, but he will show up in a matter of speaking. So turn up the rads, my Fallout chads, and let's crack open the Fallout Bible. Every installment begins with somewhat of an introduction and prelude, and this one is no exception, and I'll provide a summary. Coming out around July 10th, 2002, Chris starts by giving his own definition of the Fallout Bible, stating that it is just a collection of all the background material and hijinks from Fallout 1 and Fallout 2, compiled into one document. I find that an interesting description since the Fallout Bible has come to represent something far more authoritative than a collection of background materials and hijinks. He addresses this, however, by saying that the term Bible is misleading as it isn't supposed to be super authoritative or have religious connotations. But it is a term that he stole from Fallout developer Chris Taylor, who himself stole the name from someone else named Dan Wood. Chris makes a point to lay out what questions he will and won't answer. The things that he will not answer, since according to him, he is busy and he hates us, which we know is a lie. He does nothing all day and is completely enamored with us. And those questions are as follows. He won't give hints or walkthroughs. He won't provide technical assistance with the game. He won't answer questions outside of Fallout and Fallout 2. And that includes the much anticipated Fallout 3. He will also not read fan fiction or fan created material for Fallout. But Chris, how else are you going to get good ideas? I'm jumping ahead a bit in the Bible, but it's pertinent here. Chris also mentions specific questions that he won't answer, in addition to the generalized ones he just mentioned. The first is, When is Fallout 3 going to happen? How's Fallout 3 coming along? I heard you guys are working on Fallout 3. When is it due out? Will Fallout 3 be ready by Christmas? Is Fallout 3 contingent on getting the Bible done? Are you guys planning on a sequel to Fallout 2? Chris's response is, Fallout 3 isn't in production. Fallout 3 isn't contingent on getting the Bible done. The Fallout Bible isn't a marketing ploy. I am compiling this information because it's fun and because I'm trying to get prepped to release a Fallout pen and paper game for free on the web. And it pays to run this stuff by you guys and get your feedback, since a hundred extra pairs of eyes and torches never hurts. I swear upon Josh Sawyer's life that I will never answer this question again. If you email me this question, I will not answer it. We all know how much Chris values Josh Sawyer's life, so that last statement doesn't hold a lot of weight. Question 2. What happened to China, Russia, or any other areas outside of the area explored in Fallouts 1 and 2? 
I don't know. To tell you the truth, I really don't care. Since I am an ugly American living in California, I only care about the areas in Fallout 1 and Fallout 2, and possibly any areas close by that have some impact on them. As for the rest of the world, ROW, there's little to nothing on the rest of the world that hasn't been hinted at in the games. This also includes sections of North America and the United States that weren't in Fallout 1 or 2. Anything I would write would be speculation and would require a great deal of research, much more than I can put in on weekends. So it's going to be a while before you see these answers. It's quite possible you may never see these answers. Fleshing out other countries may pigeonhole potential future Fallout titles that would want to make up their own history for the region. I may change my mind later because I'm fickle, but until then, don't send me these questions either. Aw, oh, Chris, don't be so hard on yourself. At least you have a sick jacket. I do think this is a wise approach, and as much as we want to know what happened to areas that aren't mentioned in the game, the only good way to know for sure is to get information from the games, which are the ultimate authority. What was US and world history like before the timeline included in previous Fallout updates? No one asked us this yet, but I thought I would cut this question off at the pass. Fallout takes place on a future Earth in an alternate timeline. I will not be including any information on how and when it diverged. It will remain one of the mysteries of the setting. Just let it be known that it diverged after World War II and leave it at that. This sentiment reflects an interesting difference between Interplay's take on the Fallout universe and Bethesda. Confirmed pre-World War II events that are contrary to real-world history are very rare in the first Fallouts, but Bethesda doesn't have any issue with coming up with new historical events. What were the experiments in the other vaults and where are they located? Answering this might curtail any adventure seeds for the future, so I won't be answering it. What cities were nuked and which ones weren't? See answer number four. If someone is making a game in a section of the Fallout universe, then I'd like to leave them the freedom to say what was nuked and what wasn't. In addition to a list of things he won't answer, Chris has questions that he will answer or information that he appreciates from his fans. These include suggested material for the Bible, 50s era music, comments on pen and paper roleplay, questions about Fallout events, or good suggestions for source material as Chris was in the process of creating his own pen and paper Fallout adventure. Fallout Bible installment number 5, which is the one that came right before this one, had a small contest where Chris asked people to find the missing Magic 8-Ball text that he purposefully excluded when talking about it, and the winners were Sebastian Case and Gammons, who won nothing but Chris's adoration apparently. Chris then calls out a couple fan sites, including one from Peter Nelliman and a well-known fan called Deadless. This is what the first website used to look like, apparently called The Hub. However, I was not able to find the second site in the Wayback Machine, so we'll just have to use our imagination. Chris outlines the kind of questions that might take a while for him to answer, specifically ones related to blueprints and schematics for in-game items, like power armor or robots. Since the models and concepts don't exist, and Chris would have to convince a Black Isle artist to drum something up. Alright, let's get into the real meat of the Fallout Bible. Chris has a section he calls Pie in the Face section, where he owns up to his mistakes. He had to issue corrections to his Fallout timeline that he created in the first Bible entry, correcting the date that Zax 1.0 went first online to 2053, and the date when the Vault Dweller first leaves Vault 13 for good and travels north to Arroyo in 2162. The next section is titled Questions Galore, and dear Adam above, are there a lot of questions. This will be an enormous question and answer section. And because it is so big, I will have to split this installment up into two videos. But there's nothing really left to it but to do it. I was just wondering, once when I killed the Deathclaw in Navarro, Zarn, I think, I used an energy weapon and had a critical hit, the kind where the target drops everything on the ground when they die. The claw that he was wielding fell, and it was a purple or maybe blue square with white text that said Deathclaw Weapon 2 or something like that. This item was an okay melee weapon. Do you have any knowledge about this? What we do in most of the RPGs we make, both in Fallout and in the Infinity Engine games, is equip monsters and NPCs with invisible weapons that simulate their attacks. The items are supposed to vanish upon death, but if you hit it too hard and too fast for the computer to handle, boom, it may drop it. So that's the big mystery. Oh, and way to kill Zarn, you big savior of the world, you. 
I know that the Enclave didn't even exist as an idea in Fallout 1, but it is in Fallout 2, and I thought that you guys have a ready story why Enclave didn't do anything about Master and you didn't put it in the game for some reason. Nope, there was no ready story, at least that I was aware of. Kane and crew coined the Enclave, and they may have had some reason why they didn't do anything about the Master. It may just be that the Enclave was only active in Northern California, and besides, not many people even knew about the Master's operation in Southern California anyway. I personally think this is a pretty reasonable explanation. There are always issues when explaining intents of groups that hadn't been considered before. But given Fallout 1 focused more on Southern California, and Fallout 2 was more North and West, I think this is fine. Although the Enclave's interest in old military and scientific buildings like the West Tech facility in The Glow and Mariposa would likely be substantial. Eh, I guess I have to be patient. By the way, I know that you answered one, only one of the smallest one of my questions, by the way too, in Tanker there was a dead Vault 13 guy near those vault doors. How did he get there? Blah blah, you know the rest, by the way three, how did those aliens, floaters, and other things get into the tanker? They sneaked in or something? I had some other questions but I forgot them. Oh. That Ed guy. You see Ed, Ed is dead. Supposed to be like another in-joke like Leonard Boyarsky? Vault suit guy in tanker. Unknown. It's possible he was a test subject left over from the Enclave when they held the tanker, or a traveler from Vault City. His origin was never mentioned in the documentation. The aliens, floaters, and centaurs were placed in the tanker, since we needed some major baddies in the tanker at the end game. They most likely crawled there in search of a lair before the punks showed up. Centaurs and floaters get around, mostly wherever game logic, not necessarily plausibility, dictates. Ed. Yeah. It's an in-joke. According to Chris Taylor, Zed's dead, baby. Zed's dead. From Pulp Fiction. That's part of the reference. Ed was twofold. To immediately show the player that the outside world was dangerous, and to tell the player that he wasn't the first choice of someone to send out. Ed was sent before the water chip malfunction, however, since he's just bones. So there you are. The entirety of the tanker's hold is rather mysterious to me. From the enemies, to the vault door just chilling in there, the dead vault suit guy, Chris talks about it a little later, but I would be interested to hear your guys' ideas justifying it all. In the undergrounds of Broken Hills, there was another dead vault woman with no legs. I know it's a small detail, but you can always make something interesting out of nothing. But please make her someone interesting, not just someone from Vault City. Sorry, there were no other vaults around. She's from Vault City, one of the many Vault City unfortunates who couldn't adapt to the harsh life of the wasteland. I do not know whether she had any legs while she was alive. There was a repair bot in Klamath's underground. Was it from that vertebrate near the second repair bot near the canyon? It's possible, but unlikely. Vertebrates tend to carry only one Mr. Handy when possible. It was most likely an old repair bot from the days when Klamath Falls was a real town. There's a corpse under some rocks in Redding of a man in a vault suit. Where is he from and how did he get there and how did he die? He's another sucker from Vault City possibly having come in on a caravan. He could also be a fugitive enclave scientist or worker, since they wear vault suits too, but this is unlikely. I do think Chris is mistaken here as the people seen roaming freely on the oil rig with vault suits are enclave citizens, not scientists, as they are shown to be wearing lab coats. Vault doors were in the tanker in San Fran. From which vault are they from and who brought them onto the ship? They are unmarked models, planned for shipment somewhere up or down the west coast. The vault doors were used for more than just vaults, however, so the door may have been intended for some other facility. It's most likely just there because of designer caveat slash designer privilege slash game logic. The designer probably just needed something to fill up space in the tanker, and the door looked like good junk. And there you go. Chris doesn't think that it is necessarily a vault door, although that exact vault door style has become synonymous with vault tech vaults. The Bible's updated again and it's been a while since I've sent those questions. Answer please. Oh, and one new question. Is IPA and the other locations that weren't added to Fallout 2 in Master.dat or somewhere else finished? Because you can replace one of the existing towns with ex.ipa, but I haven't got time to check on this. No. They were never finished. I posted the original design for the EPA below, much 
much farther below, if you want to see it. There's not one for the abbey or the primitive village that I can find. Now the EPA, or Environmental Protection Agency, was a bonus location for Fallout 2, and that is what the question and answer is referring to. The EPA will show up several times in this installment, so I will not go into depth here because it'll show up later. How did that guy from New Reno Arms get Vault Tech speech modules? And how did that friend of Vic from Vault City get the Vault 13 flasks? I don't remember that it was explained in Fallout 2. Oh, and why didn't the Enclave do anything about Master after he took the Vault Tech demonstration vault? By the way, how did Master move? He's just a big piece of crap. <laughs> Before I get to Chris's answer, can we just appreciate how awesome Gray is to read some of these questions? Also for context, the so-called speech module in the question is the Vault Tech voice recognition module that was sabotaged in Vault 13 and was the only way the intelligent death claws that took up residency there could interact with the main computer. The death claws will give the chosen one the GEC, which is the whole purpose of the chosen one's mission, if they can get a new voice recognition module. One place to get a voice module is from Eldridge in Reno. Now to Chris's response. Vault Tech speech module. He got it from a traveling merchant, similar to how Vic got the Vault 13 water flask. Eldridge likes to collect old pre-war relics and throw it in his basement to keep Algernon amused, in the hopes that the kid will build a nuclear missile that he can use to hold all of New Reno hostage. Ed the Brahmin dealer may have traded with some of the Vault 13 refugees when they left the vault after the Vault Dweller at the end of Fallout 1. Or, one of the Vault 13 refugees may have traded with a random caravan master that eventually sold it to Ed. Again, it was mostly a plot device carrot and no documentation exists. The Enclave didn't even exist as an idea in Fallout 1, to my knowledge, so they never really factored into any of the events in Fallout 1. I have no idea how the master was moved. It was probably either a large steam truck or caravan but I don't have any specific information on how he was moved. I doubt a caravan could do it unless Gray was much smaller and, uh, less spread out than he was at the end of Fallout 1, which is entirely possible, but he sounded pretty f mutated in his audio diary in the military base. Maybe they poured him into a toxic waste barrel and transported him that way. I haven't found an explanation in Fallout 1 anywhere, so if anyone finds one before I post an answer, let me know. While I find a lot of these answers interesting, the last one is the most intriguing. It is peculiar that Chris specifies a steam truck in particular, which is something only mentioned one other time in the first Fallout. Should the super mutants invade Necropolis, a ghoul survivor will tell the vault dweller that super mutants came in steam powered trucks. It seems like steam powered trucks are going to be more apparent and observable in game, but it didn't end up happening. We also know that the Master integrated with electronics at the Mariposa base, but it also seems logical if he could grow and integrate that he could also decouple and kind of gather himself as well. I don't know, I would really like to hear any lore friendly explanations for how the Master could have moved over such a far distance. I'd like to know more about the player modeling behind the surface of the game. The reasons for this are that I'm participating in a course in computer science which is titled Adaptive Learning Environments. In this course, I have group work with my colleagues about user modeling in computer games. Apart from the theory, it also would really help us out a lot to hear how this is done in reality in a true game development environment. Especially in Fallout 2, there was a huge difference in the storyline depending on the way one played. I remember playing once a bit morbidly, digging up dead people and blazing my way through events. It didn't pay me in the end, or well, depends on how you see it. Usually events that one encountered were more pleasing when playing in a more ethical, correct manner. In my opinion, this kind of reflection of one's behavior to a whole scene in the game were one of the best things of the game. If you would have some time to answer me and kindly reveal some of the tricks and techniques used behind the scenes, I would really be happy for that. There really isn't any trick to it, just mostly a lot of grunt work, though fun grunt work. Essentially, what needs to be done, and I'm using an NPC's dialogue as an example, is you essentially write one dialogue that's three to four dialogues in one, and you do character checks at various points to see where the dialogue goes. I.e., if your intelligence is low, you go here. If your speech skill is high, you go here. If you're carrying a gun, you go here, and so on. It's a lot of work, and it requires that you design out all three to four of those paths completely 
so each player type gets a different experience. For quests, you do the same thing. You design it at least three different ways, so a player of different skills can solve it. I don't know if you're familiar with a choose-your-own-adventure book, but that's what the game really boils down to. It's just a big choose-your-own-adventure, where the designers try to plot out every possible path the player can take in as much detail as possible. Game logic and development parameters usually prevent you from being able to design out quest solutions with as much freedom as you would have in pen and paper games though. Perhaps you can answer the question of whether Fallout is set in an alternate timeline or not. By alternate timeline, I mean a world where some part of our history up till now was different from what we currently know. Some who claim to be in the know and say that they've seen the original design documents for the first game support this view, however I've noticed no such evidence in the Fallout Bible. Fallout takes place in an alternate timeline. There's no documentation about exactly how and when it diverged, and this will never be addressed in the Fallout Bible, see above, but it did. You have to take it on faith. I spoke on this in a previous question, but it seems like there is no longer any defining point in time for the divergence, and it is interesting that Chris does not even mention the fan-favorite transistor theory, which was a belief among the fans at that time. For context, it has been a popular theory that the divergence point of the Fallout timeline to our own was the non-invention of the transistor. But this has never been shown in lore to be true, and Chris's lack of acknowledgement is interesting in that regard. John Daly mentions that he, Melchior, gets his pets from outside, however they aren't locked in? No, that was my fault. John is blameless. I forgot the Enclave had sealed off the base. Melchior's pets probably came from the now collapsed side caverns in the military base, kind of like those mutated pig rats running around. Sorry about that. I need to research the military base some more, so if I find anything different, I'll let you know. What is the deal with the retinal scanner from the docks in San Francisco, and all those guys blumbering about some submarine? The retinal scanner was there just for show. As for the submarine, that's a longer story. As mentioned in Fallout 2, the Shi, or more specifically, Dr. Feng, said that they are descendants from the crew of a Chinese nuclear submarine, the Shi Huangti the remains of which were used to help build the palace in San Francisco. This submarine was supposed to play a larger role in Fallout 2, but it was axed because the game was too big as it was. Basically, it was another stage for the Get the Tanker Ready quest. Basically, there was this old Chinese submarine buried beneath in the waters of San Francisco, and if it detected any American vessel coming anywhere near it, its automated defense system would fire its missiles at the vessel and destroy it. So the intention was for you to find some deactivation code to disarm it before you could take the tinker safely to the Enclave. I think this is a really interesting cut part of Fallout 2, and as much as I want to see all the intended content for games make it into production, looking at you Underwater Vault in Fallout 4, I think this was a good call. Trying to work with the punks, the she, the hubologists, and the Brotherhood to finally set off for the oil rig to deal with the Enclave was already enough, and another step to keep an old sub from sinking the tanker would have just added an extra chore with not much else to give. Last update, you said that there was one car for every 200 people in the NCR. If there are so many working cars in the NCR, where are they? They're there. It's game logic. You don't see them for the same reason the NCR is only three maps, only has one counselor slash senator, and only about 40 to 50 people in its city limits. That's why the chop shop in Reno exists. Why the bum outside of the NCR offers to watch a car for you before you show up in one, and a reason that the NCR built a garage in Shady Sands. So to explain game logic in this instance, there's nothing precious about building a car of your own if you can steal one, or if somebody else in the town has one, or in the words of one designer, me, there's no good reason why a PC would want to undertake a f huge FedEx quest to rebuild one if they can jack one from the locals. The last part is especially true considering town-wide mass murder is possible in both Fallout 1 and 2. And before you get the image of tanks and jeeps flying around everywhere with heavy machine guns mounted on the back, most of that junk is old tractors and crap like taxis, old buses, snow plows, and even old construction equipment. 
It's possible that the mysterious old steam truck mentioned in the bowels of the Fallout 1 data archive is still lumbering around somewhere. The caravan houses of the hub, in particular, around the time in Fallout 2, have been looking to further their trade influence, and new vehicles and types of transport such as trains, boats, or barges have been eagerly sought out for carrying large amounts of trade goods vast distances. Good old human greed will move mountains, or at least rebuild things that can. Once they learn of the Enclave's presence in the north, they are likely to have huge bounties promised for vertebrate plants, or better, a working vertebrate. This is a really great point by the big man himself, something that is important to remember no matter what developer is at the helm of the franchise. Not every aspect can be shown in an obvious and plain manner to the player. And thinking of something like Fallout 3's lack of agriculture in this lens is healthy for us fans. Games are limited by technology, time, and resources. Therefore, players may experience things in ways that may seem illogical. In Fallout 2, the random encounter Cafe of Broken Dreams, Tandy says Ian is somewhere in Fallout 2. Is this true, and if so, where? For context, the encounter at Cafe Broken Dreams is a meta random encounter that has characters from the first Fallout, as well as all the Vault Dweller character models, including some that were cut in the original game. Tandy is a big fat liar. Ian was originally intended to be in Fallout 2, as a very old guy in the den, but it was scrapped near the end because there were, in our opinion, too many characters making repeat appearances already. If I can dig up his old dialogue at some point, I will. A later Fallout Bible entry will actually give us more information related to Ian's planned inclusion in Fallout 2, so we'll just have to be patient. Also, Ian was such a notorious companion that I do wish that he had been included in Fallout 2, even though there were already a good number of returning characters. Who owned the dog named Sasha that appears as an easter egg? At the cathedral, there's a dog outside that you can't get to, but whose description says that she's a Siberian husky faithfully awaiting her owner's return. Then in the den, one of the things that the addicts would yell periodically is, SASHA! Which of the developers owned Sasha? Sasha was owned by Vince DiNardo, one of the producers here at Interplay. He didn't work on Fallout, but he was friends with many of them. He produced Conquest of the New World, among other titles. I think Dave Hendy said, Sasha is the name of one of Interplay's old producers, Vince DiNardo. He did not work on Fallout 1 or 2. It was a bit of a tradition to have his dog somewhere in an Interplay game in some shape or form. Sasha is normally placed in the special thanks section or some other place in most of our older manuals. How do the Raiders continue as organizations over the years? Do they recruit people or do they have kids of their own? I ask because you never see any Raider kids and it seems to me that Raiders would not be good at raising kids and keeping them healthy. It's mostly for game logic reasons. Kind of like the fact that the NCR is only three maps, has one counselor, etc, etc. You try not to put kids in places where there's going to be gunfights because they tend to get caught in the crossfire and before you know it, you've got the child killer perk. Also, if you're playing the English version, then some kids are removed for localization purposes. But if Fallout took place in the real world, raider kids would exist. Raiders add to their numbers through press gang tactics, captives from raids, crushing the spirits of slaves and drafting them, and having children of their own. They also add to their ranks by attracting ne'er-do-wells from across the wastes. It's a rough life, but raiders do sometimes have kids and families with them in the band even if they don't always take them on raiding missions. I know kids in video games that have to do with adult themes is a tricky area for many reasons, so I understand why Fallout has chosen overwhelmingly to leave kids out of those situations. That said, getting a more intimate look at raider groups and how they function in a future game would be really cool. My interest in the raiders has been perked, specifically I'm wondering about their culture, if you can call it that. First off, I'm going to include a section on the Vipers that I found in some old design documentation by Scott Campbell. The cons you already met in Fallout 1, but the Vipers are the other side of the coin. They may help answer some of your questions. Basically, Raiders are a pretty varied bunch. What sort of religion or at least superstitions do Raiders have? It varies. There's no one overall religion for all Raiders. Some have none at all, the cons, while others, the Vipers, are zealots. In some regions of Fallout, 
raiders blur into tribals. So there are raiding bands of tribals that have a number of bizarre customs, including eating fallen opponents, ancestor worship, sun slash nature worship, and so on. Usually, however, raiders are just violent assholes begging to be shot. Do they have any real culture or customs? I know that raiders like the Vikings and Mongolians did. Again, it varies, depending on the raider band and depending on the region. It can be something as simple as survival of the fittest, with the strongest raider ruling everyone else, like Garl, and occasional codes of conduct, such as never surrender to the law, never leave witnesses, never bargain with a town or caravan master, to a complex set of customs and rituals such as the vipers. On the subject of their families, do raiders ever marry or have an equivalent to it? You've mentioned that they would have families, but if both Ma and Pa are out on raids, who takes care of the kids? Does someone stay behind? They can marry if they choose to honor frontier law or follow a religion, but others simply take mates or partners for a period of time, then switch around. On occasion, the leader of a raider band has the sole pick of any members of the, usually, opposite sex in the camp. Some raider bands take women and children from towns in the wastes, or from caravans, which keeps their numbers up. Over time, these slaves become assimilated into the band. Often, they have nowhere else to go. This happens in slaver bands as well. As for kids, if they can carry a gun and shoot it, they are sometimes brought with the raiders to teach the young ones about the life early. In some raider bands, going on the first raid is a rite of passage for children. Younger children are left back at the camp with a few of the raiders. Not all raiders always participate in an attack. Do they minimize violence and infighting within their camps? Depends. Some camps don't, which is probably why there's not a larger amount of raiders prowling the wastes. Usually the presence of a strong leader prevents arguments from erupting too frequently, or allows for controlled violence, where disputes are settled before the leader, usually with a fist or a knife fight. Furthermore, it's in the raider's interest to police their own. The life of a raider is tenuous, and troublemakers need to be dealt with swiftly. Furthermore, a number of raiders are free to sate their violent urges on the towns and caravans they prey on, which helps a bit. Otherwise, violence and infighting usually comes down to fist or knife fights in camp, especially if alcohol and drugs are present, and either no lasting wounds are inflicted, or else are fights to the death, and the loser is left to die in the wastes. This is where Kaisar's Legion can provide an interesting case study. It can show the evolution of raiders and tribal groups transforming into a larger unified group with an identity. And best yet, this lore was written by some of the same people that created Fallout's first raider groups. Chris then references some design documentation that goes over the jackals, vipers, and cons, all raider groups that are at least mentioned in the first Fallout although not all appear. The design documents are as follows. The first clan, the Jackals, is your typical group of crazies. They have no morals except one, survival. They use group tactics to overmatch their enemies. They are craven cowards though, and will not attack unless they know they can win. They band together in their hideaway and fight over the spoils. This second clan, the Vipers, are mysterious followers of an ancient religion or so they claim. They usually only come out at night to hunt for food or to conduct raids. They are very ruthless when it comes to combat. They prefer stealth to strength. They usually carry bone knives dipped in pit viper venom. This poison, when in the bloodstream, paralyzes the victim. Most victims captured in this way are taken back to their hideout. The last group, the Khans, is probably the most dangerous. They live the lifestyles of Mongol warriors, raiding towns, burning what they cannot take, and capturing the survivors for use as slaves. They usually travel in small scouting bands, but sometimes they roam as full war parties. The Khans, above all else, respect strength. They are eager in combat to prove their worthiness to the clan by engaging in hand-to-hand -hand combat with fists or clubs. The Khans carry very few firearms, since they're for cowards. Anyone showing superior strength is worthy of their respect. The leader of the Khans is so, because no one has beaten him in combat. Chris then says, One interesting thing listed in the original documentation is that all raider bands were supposedly all from Vault 15 after it opened, but they all splintered off into different groups from the overpopulated vault. 
all of these raider groups officially exist in the Fallout universe, though only the Khans are in Southern California at the start of Fallout 1. The handful of Vipers that survived Rhombus' campaign of extermination in 2155 fled north and east, following the same path that the Jackals took after they had their ass handed to them by the Khans 30 years before. Chris then goes into detail about the Vipers, mentioning that they were created by Scott Campbell, and that although snakes are not seen in Fallout, they are indeed there. This is what the design documents say. Background 64 years ago, a man named Jonathan Faust led his group of about 200 people from the overcrowded vault into the wastes of the outside. It was there that his small band came to a small oasis in the middle of the desert. In the middle of this oasis was a large pit, almost like a crater. While resting and setting up camp, Faust decided to look into the pit. Darkness greeted him. When a member of the band called out to him, Faust turned, startled, and slipped into the pit. He slid down 20 feet and then fell another 20 and broke his legs in the process. As he lay there dazed, a half dozen gigantic pit vipers slithered toward him. Not knowing what these things were, Faust was terrified. The group above heard one loud scream and then nothing. Three others went to look for him, but never came out. The small band, leaderless and stuck in the desert with no food and water, decided to stay at the oasis, at least for a little while. They covered the pit with a tarp and nailed spikes around it to keep whatever horror lived there encased there. They then set up their camp as far from the pit as possible. Whatever was down in the pit never bothered them. Days passed. The more influential of the group argued about what they were to do. There was talk of joining up with others from the vault. There was talk of going back to the vault. During these four days, almost a quarter of the group was either dying or already dead. Those who survived the radiation poisoning were too weak to travel, while those who survived either left or stayed and helped defend the little settlement against the desert creatures. Finally, after a week, the remaining members of the group decided to move on. They started to pack their belongings when an almost spectral figure emerged from the shadows. It was Faust, except this was not the strong leader they remembered. He was Wayne, pale and emaciated, and there was a feverish gleam in his eyes. He told them that when he was down in the pit, a god visited him and told him the true way. They would make sacrifices to the gods of the pit, and wealth and happiness would be theirs. Of course, everyone was skeptical. Some were even violently rebellious, saying that Faust was crazy. After Faust patiently listened to them, he then whistled, and from behind him came two very large pit vipers. Without warning, they struck. They attacked everyone in the group, including Faust, but he just laughed as they bit his flesh. As the sun rose the next day, the two snakes lay dead by Faust's hands. Half of his people were dead, and the other half were on the brink of death as the pit venom started to sink into their systems. By that afternoon, most would be dead, but the 40 or so survivors of the venom were half crazy with the after effects of the venom. Faust himself, immune to the venom, helped the remaining few through this time, which has come to be known as the Great Awakening. He whispered things to them, told them how the Great Snake has spared their lives, so that they would fight for his mighty cause. And thus the Viper Clan was born. They decided to make their pit their shrine, and to go out into the wastes and take what they needed from those blasphemers that did not follow the winding way of the Great Snake. When Faust, or the Great Snake Keeper as he was called, grew too old to rule, his son, Asp, was given the sacred role of leader and high priest. He has ruled ever since. The leaders of the Vipers, Asp, conducts their ceremonies and administers duties. The members of the clan will follow his orders even if it meant death. Asp is usually in the same type of bone armor as the others, save he wears a snake skull as a helmet adorned with feathers and a snake skin as a cape. The vipers are always dressed in bone armor. This armor, as the name implies, is made from strips of bone bundled around the body with strips of leather. All viper clan members have crude tattoos all over their bodies. Exotic piercings are not uncommon. The vipers usually carry bone knives, bone spears, and sometimes pistols. 
The Viper Hideout, or as they call it, the Shrine, is many small adobe buildings surrounding a large pit. This pit is where they conduct their religious ceremonies. The sacrifices are placed within the pit, and several huge pit vipers slither out to claim their meal. Although it has never happened, if anyone were to escape the pit, the vipers would let that individual go, claiming it was the will of the great snake. Rituals Once a month, the vipers fall into a deep trance through a dangerous mixture of alcohol and snake venom. Anyone who doesn't awake is considered to have been found unworthy by the great snake. When the vipers reach manhood, they are given a special mixture of the pit viper venom. Those who die or are in a coma for more than seven nights are given as sacrifices to the children. The snakes in the pit are officially called the children of the great snake. Those who survive the week-long delirium become warriors of the snake, also called chosen ones. There is a monthly ritual where the venom is taken by the high priest and priestesses of the tribe in small quantities, which causes bizarre dreams. That is called the time of the summoning because many claim to see the great snake come to them in their dreams. When it is time for a captured prisoner to be sacrificed, he is typically hurled into the pit at midnight. Camp Breakdowns The Pit This is the large pit that lies in the center of the viper's camp. It currently holds four giant pit vipers. Each one is old and very well fed, but they are still very deadly. The pit itself branches off into many tunnels where the player can find Faust's old staff, as well as many nests of rats. One of the tunnels opens up into a secret exit near the mountains, so a resourceful player could use it to escape after being hurled into the pit. The Sanctuary This is where Asp sleeps and attends to the governmental duties of his people. His mate, the High Priestess of the Great Snake, is always close by. They have no children. The meeting room itself is long and lined with torches. The throne Asp sits on was made from the skulls and bones of the two snakes that Faust killed during the Great Awakening. The Cages Where the prisoners are kept Located at the very edge of the oasis, they cannot taint the snakes with unbelievers, these pits are dug into the ground. Their entrances are made of iron gates set into the stone ground of the oasis. They are usually guarded by the Crimson Tongue, the special elite warriors. The reason they are used to guard this is because a lot of the time the cages are used to hold the sacrifices to the children. The Hall of Ascension. This is the ceremonial lodge used in the time of summoning. This is also used for all religious purposes except the snake sacrifice, which is done on a platform set up over the pit. Chris then explains that there is at least one other personality mentioned as belonging to the Viper's band, a woman named Cobra, a brewer of the Viper clan, responsible for making the snake venom or extracting it from the pit vipers. She has a son named Fang and her husband died long ago. In the original design documentation, there was an adventure seed for any characters coming across Garl from the cons. He would task the player to go kill Asp and take his ceremonial helmet and dagger. Although Garl prefers the direct approach, he knows the Vipers rival the Khans in strength, and if Asp is killed, it has a good chance of scattering the Vipers. Both the Khans and the Jackals hate the Vipers, but the Khans and Jackals hate each other more than the Vipers, so there is a nice little hatred pecking order going on. This is all the original design doc information but the lore stated in-game has altered in a few ways. For one, the Vipers are from Vault 15. Mutated snakes do exist in Fallout, the Vipers' leader name is unknown, and that group has no stable location. They wander, carrying a bunch of snakes in a steel drum supported by slaves and Brahmin. Chris then explains the events that led to the Vipers leaving Southern California. Defeat at the Hub in 2125 their failed attempt to raid the hub during the hub's formative years was stopped almost solely by Angus, the founder of the hub. Angus's defense caused the vipers to retreat north, and they roamed the wastes for many, many years, occasionally attacking caravans and small settlements. Around the early 2050s, however, the vipers had grown to their former strength from captured slaves and caravan drivers, and had began to establish a power base in the badlands to the north of the hub and south of the Lost Hills Bunker. Driven by a religious, driven by a religious frenzy, and the need to provide for their much larger numbers of soldiers and disciples, they began raiding more frequently than before. 
attracting the attention of the Brotherhood of Steel. The Brotherhood sent out a few squads of scouts to track the raiders down. It was more of a training exercise conducted by John Maxon's father, as the Brotherhood was convinced that a small detachment of troops in power armor would be sufficient to deal with a group of raiders, no matter how large. Near extermination by the Brotherhood of Steel in 2155. One Brotherhood squad found the Vipers, and during the firefight, John Maxon's father, who was leading the squad, was killed with a poisoned arrow. The response from the Brotherhood was immediate. The Paladins, the Paladins now led by Rhombus, began a full-scale campaign against the Vipers, tracking them down and wiping out almost all of their members within the span of a month. A handful of Vipers were able to flee north and east into the mountain range, but they were never heard from again. During the campaign, the Brotherhood sent a few scouts and emissaries to the hub to track down Viper members, and from these beginnings, the hub and the Brotherhood began full trade relations. Caravans had delivered to the Brotherhood before, but not long after the destruction of the Vipers, caravan trains ran directly from the hub to the Brotherhood on a regular basis. So some good did come out of the Viper's presence in the wastes, for what it's worth. Chris now continues on with the questions. I wasn't kidding when I said this installment is absolutely chock full. Are Fallout locations made according to real places, or did you make them up? I mean specifically the Hub, Junktown, Gecko, and Modoc. Some are based on real places. Necropolis equals Bakersfield. Klamath is Klamath Falls. Redding is Redding. But the Hub, Junktown, and Gecko were all made up locations. Modoc most likely took its name from the Modoc National Forest, located near the location. Modoc was originally the name of an Indian tribe in the region, I believe. Arroyo is a fictional locale, according to Tim Kaine. Does the Fallout 1 military base exist? According to Chris Taylor, Mariposa military base is based on Fort Ord, if I recall correctly. That's an old military base that has been shut down near Monterey Bay. What happened to inhabitants in Los Angeles when the bombs dropped? Chris Taylor answers this question as follows. This isn't canon, but I'd always imagined that LA was pretty much decimated, which is one killed out of every 10, thanks Romans. Most people in LA died after the bombs dropped due to radiation poisoning, disease, famine, and each other. Most of the people in the demonstration vault left, and of those that remained, most became the master servants and members of the children of the cathedral. Those that left could be part of almost any organization in LA. The majority of people in LA would have to be people who came to the city after the destruction, most to scavenge what they could, be it equipment, food, or people. One would think that LA would have a lot of vaults, since the earliest vault construction efforts took place here, and at least a dozen people live in the greater LA area. You said in the Fallout Bible that ghouls still live in Necropolis, but in the manual it is written that the city was completely wiped out. I find this odd since I assumed that Fallout 2 continued with the assumptions that the Vault Dweller more or less did everything the quote unquote best way possible in Fallout 1, such as taking the base in time. Perhaps I'm misunderstanding something here, which is not too unlikely considering how long it's been since I've had time to play the game, so anything to help clear up this little question of mine is really appreciated. I am wrong. Most ghouls were forced to leave Necropolis, leading to the Great Migration across the Wastes. I will print retractions later. The Great Migration being referenced here is the dispersal of ghouls from Necropolis to places like Gecko, Broken Hills, and Dayglow, where the ghouls made new settlements. What happened to Sergeant Granite and his crew after the destruction of the Enclave? He and the Enclave crew hopped aboard the tanker and escaped to the mainland after watching the fireworks from atop the bunker, whispering, God damn, to themselves and throwing suggestive glances at the women from Vault 13 and Arroyo. After reaching the mainland, they headed north to Navarro, or the remains of Navarro, depending on how your player character left it, and were never heard from again, though their adventures could fill several eras worth of pulp comics, including a recent reappearance in Keith Griffin's Resurrection of Suicide Squad. Sergeant Granite is the leader of a group of Enclave soldiers that appear as the Chosen One confronts Frank Horgan right as they are leaving the doomed oil rig. They can be convinced to help the Chosen One, and it appears Chris considers this the canon ending since they can then escape on the tanker. How was the Brotherhood of Steel involved in NCR after the destruction of the Enclave? Unknown. Presumably they'd already established some level of coexistence with the NCR, 
even before the events of Fallout 1. Judging by one of the states of the NCR being dubbed Maxin, more on that in a future update, except to say that the Lost Hills bunker was not turned into a town in NCR, and considering their pre-existing ties to the hub, which became a state by the time of Fallout 2. I've always imagined that the NCR and Brotherhood of Steel have maintained an uneasy truce, with barter and some technology sharing between the two groups. It's really interesting to see Chris speak of this, since he and other creative minds behind Fallout New Vegas were able to give us actual lore pertaining to how the Brotherhood and NCR got along, as the NCR grew in power. This isn't the time to delve into that, but suffice it to say, it didn't go great. What happened to the doctor guy who released the modified FEB virus into the EC's air ducts? This references Charles Curling, the head of the Chemical Corps, who can be convinced by the Chosen One to use the FEV against the Enclave instead of being released into the atmosphere. Devastated in the wake of finding his moral center, he did not inoculate himself. When he released the toxin, it is believed he died with the rest of the Enclave, but his body was never found. What happened to Skynet? Skynet's fate is undocumented. If I was to speculate, he left the player and began to travel west into the wasteland, looking for terminals and data to acquire more knowledge, collect more data, and perhaps settle down in a mainframe. The frame he was in, and the brain he had, could only store so much information, and AIs need more data storage space to grow in order to evolve. It is possible he made his way to the glow, but it's not known for sure. Any fan writers out there, feel free to round out what happened to him. Considering his combat messages alone, the world's in for a shaken. In the official universe, Skynet is not his real name. Like other aspects in the Sierra Army Depot, i.e. the news reports, it needs to be revised into the timeline. Sue me. My lawyers will be in contact with you, Chris. Skynet is an AI that can be put into a robo-brain and possible companion, and is an awesome but rather unnecessary part of Fallout 2. Skynet absolutely should show up in a future Fallout in some form or another. What happened to Marcus? Inspired by the example set by the Chosen One, Marcus eventually traveled across the Great Mountains to the east, searching for other refugees from the Master's army. You never heard from him again. What happened to Goris? No one knows. He is the last of his kind, a tortured soul in a kingdom of ruins. Can you hear him howling in the darkness at the edge of the firelight? Of course you can. Shed not a tear for brave Goris. He has served the good people of the Wastes, and now his time is done. What happened to K9 from Navarro? After getting his motivator repaired, K9 was left in the NCR by the Chosen One so that he could receive necessary repairs from Dorothy, and not long after his recovery, Dr. Henry, who had been placed in critical condition after being reportedly assaulted by the Chosen One sometime earlier. Dr. Henry, afraid that too much information about the Enclave would be obtained from K9, attempted to destroy the cyborg, but was stopped by Cyberdog and Dorothy, who suspected what Dr. Henry was planning. The NCR government used the attack as an excuse to confiscate K9 and Cyberdog in order to learn more information about the Enclave as well as what makes the two of them tick. At last report, and over Dorothy's objections, K9 and Cyberdog were disassembled and analyzed. Structural damage during the disassembly is reported to have killed them both. What happened to Zarn the intelligent Deathclaw from Navarro? According to Fallout 2 designer John Daly, Zarn was supposed to go back to Vault 13 and warn the Vault about Horgan's attack, but he never made it. In the original design, he was supposed to be able to go back and save all the Deathclaws and warn them about the Enclave, but this didn't make it in. He was last seen wandering east into the wastes toward Vault 13. He never made it, however, so his final destination is unknown. So if super mutants can now reproduce, Goris and Zarn can perpetuate the intelligent Deathclaw race and new ghouls are being made from over-radiated people dying. That would mean humans, super mutants, ghouls, and intelligent Deathclaws would be major races in New California, right? They can't. Marcus was joking in New Reno. Super mutants are sterile. Blame me for another episode of bad humor, oh cruel reader. Goris and Zarn did not perpetuate the race. They are the last of their kind. The predominant and most accepted race in the NCR is human, and probably will be for generations. 
while super mutants and ghouls are tolerated, although some gain true acceptance, especially in the military and in the NCR Rangers, death claws of any intelligence would not be. Assuming any significant number survived the Enclave's massacre at Vault 13, which they didn't. The logic for ending the intelligent Deathclaw race was justified by saying the genes for intelligence were male dominant, and the last two known intelligent Deathclaws were male, so according to Fallout, they couldn't pass on those genes. I'm not sure that tracks though. Belief System from the looks of Fallout and Fallout 2, everything seems pretty non-denominational, but there are still allusions to Zionity. Any generally accepted ideology in the wastes? I'm assuming it would be monotheistic. Any interesting tribal religions you would care to elaborate more on? How about clearing up some of Hakanin's gibberish? Side question, where's the name Hakanin from? Not any relation to Bakanin, I hope, though I guess Hakanin looks a bit like Bakanin post-scurvy. All the basic belief pre-war systems are probably still out there, but they haven't been addressed in any Fallout game out of fear of riling the masses. The Habologists are probably the closest we ever got, and even they are an amazing coincidence to a contemporary religion. As a result, there's probably not much point on speculating on them except to say that they probably survived in some fashion. Individual designers may end up resurrecting other religions if necessary, to create controversy and screaming matches in newspapers and message boards. In my opinion, the entire spectrum of Christianity still exists, and has scattered into even more splinter groups. Mormonism still exists, since it was hard to nuke all of Utah, and Mormons are pretty hardy folk. Father Tully in New Reno wasn't really a priest, obviously, and Joe in Modoc was a minister of sorts, but neither one was a representative of a real-world religion. In the original documentation, Tully was supposed to be from the Abbey, but they drove him out after he accidentally set fire to one of their libraries. There are no tribal groups anywhere in the documentation except for the Vipers above, so anything I added would just be speculation. There are some out there. As much as Arroyo had a whole ancestor worship thing going on, there are probably Rad Scorpion, Sun, Sand, Volcano, Storm, Chem, Spore, Plant, Radiation, <laughs> worshippers out there. Hakunin's gibberish. Don't know where this name comes from. If Hakunin was part of the original Fallout 2 design, Tim Kane might know. I'll ask him at some point. His gibberish is probably due to a constant barrage of mind-altering chemicals he's been taking in his role as shaman. He's pretty whacked. Game logic reasons, however, dictate that because Hakunin's text was written by Mark O. Green, that he speaks the way he does because Mark has a talent and passion for inventing cool ways of speaking for NPCs. Sets lingo, for example, bone noses hold Jamaican dealio, and he does it because it's fun. Let's give it up for Marco Green, people. Oh, and there are plenty of cults in the wasteland. Watch out for them, because usually they don't like you and what you're thinking. This seems to be common practice even in Bethesda's games, and I understand why they'd want to sidestep any religion-based controversy. That said, I am interested in making videos focusing on what we know about pre-war and post-war religions, so wait for those to come out. What's the family structure like in the Fallout universe? From most of the examples we've seen, it looks like it sticks to the typical nuclear family or in more than usual cases, single parent homes due to the mortality rate in the waste, I'd assume. I imagine it varies according to region. There's no documentation for this but it would mostly be nuclear families, and possibly a commune here and there, or some sort of group rearing village. In situations where the genre wants to drive home the 1950s aesthetic, nuclear families are especially common. Racism. We've seen city dweller versus spear chucker discrimination in the Fallout world, but is there any sort of racism aside from human versus mutant, I mean? I figure a catastrophic event like the Great War would bring people together. There's no documentation on this, but aside from the obvious mutant, ghoul, human, and cultural bigotry, tribal versus townsfolk, fault city versus everyone else, racism and sexism, and this is just in my opinion, would be alive and well. A person's skin color, status, and career are always good excuses for fear and hate to build upon. I imagine communities like the NCR and MODOK would have less of a problem with this. The Great War may have brought some communities together, but it also made isolated communities as well. Even in Fallout 1, Shady Sands hated the hub, 
was suspicious of Junktown, and there were quite a few groups suspicious of the Brotherhood, etc, etc. There's a lot of potential for sowing the seeds of hate in Fallout. So buckle up everyone. It's not one big happy family out there. Let the flames begin. As a final note, I always thought it was kind of cool that there were lots of female Enclave soldiers, and I liked that the initial design team made Lynette head of Vault City, and in a nice twist, had her in favor of slavery to give the player more to chew on. The culture of the world got shook up in interesting ways. This is an interesting topic since a lot of ghoul discrimination mirrors racial discrimination in the later fallouts. Media can explore these topics by disarming the audience, by changing the basis of discrimination, and showcasing these situations in a relatively sterile environment. But that is a whole other discussion. I'd really like to know this. Why did they become tribals in such a short time? Religious reasons? Drugs? My problem with tribals is not their lack of technology, which is vaguely plausible, or their tribal structure, which I don't object to at all. My problem is that the nature of their tribal culture is ridiculous. It makes no sense that post-apocalyptic Americans would degenerate into pre-Columbian natives. If you're looking for plausibility in Fallout 1 and 2, you're bound to find holes, and there's not a concrete explanation for each one. And sometimes, you'll even find multiple explanations that contradict each other. The decision to make the Arroyo culture tribals was most likely a game logic slash thematic one, as plot devices tend to be. There was a certain atmosphere that the Fallout 2 initial design team established with the tribal culture in Fallout 2, and I think they just wanted to play around with the fact that the player was from a primitive, non-technological, ancestor-worshipping culture. It was a way of bringing the history of the Vault Dweller from the past into the present, and provides a nice backdrop for the events in the game. Also, one issue raised in Killian's question above is that many of the voice acted dialogues were done by Mark O. Green, who likes to play with language and culture with the characters. Personally, I like what he did with Set, Solok, the Elder, Hakunin, and the whole batch of them. Sure, they're bizarre, and they make you wonder about the culture of the world you're in, I think that's a strength, not a drawback. I think this is a very solid answer from Chris. Something came up recently regarding one of the denizens of Fault City, namely Thomas More. The question is pretty simple. Is he a reference to the author of Utopia? Leonard Boyarsky, the original Fallout 2 designer who made More, says it was most likely a reference to Chad Moore, one of the interplay artists at the time. Why did the doctor in Vault City, the one inside the vault, ask you to bring him a dose of Jet for his personal use or for research? Is this some sort of quest or is it a dead end? Dr. Troy wants the Jet so he can treat an antidote for it. Although at first glance, it appears that he's nursing a habit. It's a quest. The citizens of San Francisco often fight with knives called Shiv. I tried to use them, but it was impossible. They're really shitty daggers. Basically, their big claim to fame was supposed to be one, they would never be detected as a weapon in hand if you approached someone, or entered a boxing match, or fought in the ring against Lopan. And two, they were easy to conceal in case anyone searched you. There wasn't a way to pull off the see no evil power, so we didn't implement it. As for being searched, you don't get searched anywhere in the game except at Vault City, so the shivs just ended up being really crappy knives. Still, there were plenty of places where shivs were thematically appropriate, New Reno, so they're lying around in people's inventory. Is it true that Holly Hand Grenade can be found in a regular encounter with a cave full of enemies? I checked with Jason Suin, the random encounter designer for Fallout 2. He also designed the encounter with King Arthur. He said he doesn't think so. It's only available after the King Arthur encounter in a cave with an extremely dangerous rat. We could be wrong, and one may be accidentally placed somewhere, we're still finding the Solar Scorcher in some strange places. If you guys have a save game where this happens, let us know. With decades having passed since Chris wrote this, fans haven't found it anywhere else. But I love this reference to Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Why don't Miria and I guess Davin too promote to higher levels? Miria and Davin are siblings, the children of Grissom, who owns the Slaughterhouse in Modoc and the siblings are most well known for being able to be married to the Chosen One. Because they're terrible NPCs. Basically, they were intended as a burden rather than a force to be reckoned with. <laughs> Brutal. 
In NCR, there is a doctor, I don't remember his name, that works on an antidote for mutants. Unfortunately, the antidote is lethal. I'm curious who is that guy, because according to the dialogue, he seems to come from the Enclave, or maybe he was just working there? Dr. Henry used to work with the Enclave Cybergenetic Research Program at the Poseidon Oil Rig, and at various other Enclave installations. In the NCR, Dr. Henry claims he left because he felt his work wasn't being appreciated which is true. His theories on correcting the mutation in the wasteland population were not popular with the rest of the Enclave scientists, most notably one of his colleagues, Dr. Schraber, who he worked with jointly on many genetic research projects in the past. Dr. Henry was arguing with Schraber at the Navarro base about the mutation problem for the five billionth time when Schraber, in a fit of anger, told Henry he was going to recommend that Henry be transferred to another Enclave facility, where he would be put to work on cybernetic maintenance, the equivalent of cybernetic janitorial duty. Henry took the threat very seriously, and within hours, Dr. Henry stole a cybernetic dog and slipped away from the Navarro facility, heading east and eventually making his way to the NCR. The Enclave, while not pleased with his attitude and the directions of his research, were not happy with his escape. They needed all the scientists they can get, and several soldiers were punished for negligence. Schraber never confessed to his role in Henry's disappearance, and simply claimed that Dr. Henry had been acting suspicious for some time, and was displaying sympathies for the mainland mutants. I find Dr. Henry's involvement with the Enclave interesting. We have a special encounter with Frank Horrigan, where he confronts a man with his family, killing them when they refuse to come with Horrigan. I can't help but feel like if the Enclave really wanted Dr. Henry back, or really wanted to keep the secrets he knew from getting out, that they would have done something about it. Why is such a large city like San Francisco not so well known as Vault City? The people there didn't seem to isolate like VC citizens. I also don't understand why San Fran is avoided by caravans though there was a lot of good stuff to buy. It is actually well known, at least in the south. You just don't see caravans from San Francisco. San Francisco trades fish to other cities in the wasteland. Mmm, fish. Now a question about the Brotherhood of Steel. How did they know my hero's name? They're psychic, can read minds, consume human beings, and absorb their thoughts, and neuralink to computers like the Master. No secret is safe from them. Wow, I think I like the Brotherhood again now. The first question seems to be a walkthrough question, but I'll ask it anyway. So a guy named Matt asked about the second excavator chip in Redding. Is there any way to sell both chips? There should be only one chip. If there are two, then that's a bug. Let me know where you find the second one. The second question is a real mystery for me, because I only managed to verify part of it. Someone called Cervantes asks about the sixth toe gained in Toxic Caves, which can be removed in Vault City. That part is clear, but now is something interesting. Cervantes says that after he finished the game, Whores in New Reno kept saying, you really should use the mutated toe on Horrigan to get the full amount of points. Is this true, or is Cervantes just pulling my leg? The mutated toe is a mutation that can occur if the player spends too much time in toxic waste, and it can be stored in the character's inventory if they amputate it with an auto dock. It's just a joke. Don't do it. It doesn't do anything. Don't eat the toe either, since I believe it poisons you. What happened to the inhabitants of the Sierra Army Depot? General Clifton and his troops evacuated the base sometime between July 10th, 2077 and late October 2077, and went to join the remaining troops in neighboring installations or sent to the front lines in China or Anchorage on a plane or ship before their lives were reduced to ash by a rain of nuclear fire. Who were the Sierra Army Depot soldiers attacked by, since when you get the robot to take out his body from a tube, he says, I got to get back to my squad. Sadly, he dies. They were attacked, either by hungry or striking rioters in the United States, unlikely from Dobbs' description, however, or they were deployed to China or Alaska, where they fought the Chinese. Dobbs' unit was in Alaska when he was wounded and dumped in the meat wagon. Private First Class Dobbs was cryogenically frozen at the Sierra Army Depot, and if revived, will come to, and after running off to find his unit, succumb to post-cryogenic syndrome and melt into goo. Why does he have a Red Rider LE? I never used the BB guns because I thought they were weak. Were the enemies weak or something? 
The fact he is carrying the BB gun is a joke, as well as the fact that he dies from post cryogenic syndrome a few seconds after popping out of the tank. But the gun itself isn't very funny to anyone you shoot in the eye with it. It has a high chance of doing some blood curdling criticals and consistently does 25 points of damage with every hit, I believe. The Fallout 1 manual has an ad in the back for a Gek. When this ad was placed in the manual, was it already known that this would be the key item in Fallout 2, or was it just coincidental? No. From what Chris Taylor tells me, the Gek was created by Jason Anderson and Leonard Boyarsky for the Fallout 1 manual. It wasn't intended to be used in Fallout 2, but as far as a MacGuffin goes, it was there when it was needed. Hello, game logic. Can the Fallout 1 Vault Dweller ever beat Zax at chess? This answer is from Jesse Hynek. To beat Zax in chess, you must score a critical success on an intelligence check, and Zax must fail its check. Very, very rare circumstances. As I recall, it might be scripted so that it's only possible if a character has 10 intelligence, but I may be mistaken. It's been a while. None of the skills, except perhaps gambling, seemed really appropriate, so I decided to go with a straight stat check. In the actual game, it is not possible for the player to beat Zax no matter what they do, so Jesse Heinig seems to be mistaken here. Once I asked Butch from the Fargo Traders in the Hub about the Maltese Falcon, and he mentioned a girl named Hope, a singer at the Maltese Falcon. When I looked at your newly released concept art at vaultturkeen.net, I noticed a character named Hope. I've never been able to find this girl in-game. Why not? What role should this character have played? According to Scott Campbell, one of the original designers for Fallout 1, Hope was supposed to be a singer at the Maltese faction, who was supposed to have some adventure seeds with the Hub Underworld. It didn't make it into the game, and there's no more information on her, unfortunately. What do you need to do to save the Hub from being slaughtered by the fleeing mutants in the end scene? I finished Fallout 1 once where the Hub survived the attack, and twice where it was slaughtered, but to the best of my knowledge, I did nothing different when playing the game the second and third time beats me, I've forgotten. I think it's a time issue. If anyone out there reading this remembers, let me know, it could be a bug. So to answer Chris's answers only a few years too late, if you want to get the good ending, which has been canonized by the events of Fallout 2 in New Vegas, you need to complete the quest finding the missing caravans, don't do any of Decker's quests, complete the Iguana Bob quests, and lastly be friendly to Harold. Not doing the required quests, or even doing one of Decker's quests, will cause the bad ending to occur, or if the player lets the master live after the 140th day. I've read all the updates and I'm still curious about one thing, why the Sierra Army Depot is not mentioned at all. I think the Sierra Army Depot is not an insignificant part of the game's plot. Just on the contrary, I believe that it was something to do with the FEV experiments or with the development of futuristic weapons and armor. It doesn't look like it's just a weapons storage facility, otherwise why was it inserted into the game if it has no particular reason, or a place where one can find some stuff to sell or gain an NPC, probably one of the best. So my question is, what is what is the role of the Sierra Army Depot in Fallout, and what has it to do with the FEV experiments and weaponry development, or maybe some kind of an artificial intelligence development? First of all, the Sierra Army Depot was intended to be a bonus location for the game, just a place to adventure that wasn't tied to the main plot, kind of like the EPA, Abbey, and the Primitive Village were supposed to be. Except it made it in, as did Modoc, Nurino, and to an extent, the military base, which, while it helps support the plot, isn't a critical path. The Sierra Army Depot was used for the following. From 1992 to 2050, it was responsible for disposing much of the obsolete munitions and storage. This is true. From 2050 to 2076 is when the place started getting creepy. It became a classified facility for robotic research and development, and biological and conventional weapon testing. Skynet, constructed primarily for research purposes, went online in 2050 and it is possible that the intelligence arranged all of this, but unlikely. Again, Skynet is not its real name. Robotic Research Skynet is the first machine intelligence to be developed in the depot, and it was conceived in 2050. It didn't actually become aware until 2075, and it really started cranking on developing a cybernetic brain to help it gain mobility. In July of 2077, Skynet was copied creating two versions, one to run the defense, and the other one to sit in the lab and wait for the researchers to come back and help it finish the cybernetic brain it had spent so long developing. 
By the way, the dates that Skynet lists for its awareness and final instructions in Fallout 2 are incorrect. It became self-aware in 2075, and it was abandoned sometime in late July to early October in 2077. It is believed that the dates and other numerical data within the facility may be suffering from some damage or numeric decay in the base's internal clock. Biological Research In addition to biological weapons and drug testing, the Sierra Army Depot performed many illegal experimentations on prisoners of war and military prisoners, especially U.S. military prisoners and deserters, the ones that weren't used to stalk robobrains, however. Attempting to enhance their intelligence and fighting skills, but the chemical cocktails that the Sierra Depot crew were feeding their subjects had nothing to do with the FEV research taking place in West Tech and the Mariposa facility. Many of the brains extracted in the Sierra Army Depot found their way into robo-brains throughout the U.S. military. Furthermore, the Sierra Army Depot kept many prisoners and soldiers in stasis, most likely for medical or testing purposes, such as private Dobbs. 2077 is when Skynet was made into a multiple personality in order to oversee defense of the Sierra Depot as General Clifton and his command pulled out of the base. It has been sitting there in the darkness ever since, illuminated by tiny blinking red diodes and the whirring of magnetic tape reels. I want to be aware of one more thing. Don't think I'm too insistent. Everyone is mentioning the EPA, the Abbey and the Primitive Tribe Village. Is there any possibility of these additional locations ever being released or a crack to unpack them? The data of this location is included into the master.dat if I'm not mistaken, so there must be a way to reveal them and make them playable, right? I guess you know how it is valuable for the fans. There wasn't ever anything designed for these locations, except for the five to six pages of the EPA summary, which I've included below. The locations don't actually exist in a data file anywhere, in a playable state, or even a 50% finished state. It's doubtful we'll ever make them or release them to the public. Now, I am skipping to this section that talks about the EPA, because I'm having to break up this beast of an installment into two videos. Otherwise, this video will never come out. The EPA summary has the slogan, We asked for the future, and we got it, with the following summary in the words of the almighty Chris Avalone. The Environmental Protection Agency is a bonus location for Fallout 2. It's full of an odd assortment of puzzles, fighting, and various weird adventure seeds, literally, including, but not limited to, a parking lot jungle replete with several varieties of spore plants, a bizarre petting zoo filled with humans, hungry humans, Sublevels filled with exciting varieties of poisonous gases and virus-laden mutant fruit flies. A small government museum complete with dioramas. The exhibits on post-Holocaust America are especially amusing. A storage room full of new seeds for Arroyo. Some seeds grow into bad things. An entourage of custodial, peevish holograms that provide tours and bursts of incidental binary strangeness. Various NPCs on ice in hibernation, computers filled with information on crop rotation and the FEV virus, a clinically depressed Mr. Handy and a hyperactive drug-making appliance for science characters. The EPA was supposed to use the Vault City slash Vault 13 tile set for interiors, bright white like original vault. Special scenery objects include an EPA parking lot sign and color-coded symbols on the walls, running the whole range of the rainbow. Unique objects would be a can of dog food, a la Mad Max, insecticide, shampoo, pesticide, marijuana, pop rocks, if you drink water with them, you'll explode in a horrible death animation, EPA government power cell, bug spray canister, kills all insects instantly, plant spray canister, kills all spore plants instantly, gas mask, solar scorcher, this was its original location, test tube. Some of these ideas are pretty wild. A human petting zoo, pop rocks that make the player explode, post-Holocaust America dioramas? Fallout's EPA was going to be absolutely bonkers. The EPA is four maps large. These maps are small, and these levels often share the same map. Entrance level, which is the office building. Level red, which is security, public relations, and museum. Level orange, blood-curdling cafeterias and sinister conference rooms. Level yellow, which is the power core. Level green, which is animal and biological testing, aberratums and cages of creatures. 
Level Blue, which is hibernation. Level Indigo, which is top secret research into gender modification. Level Violet, which is the memory core. Here is the planned EPA map flow. The major adventure seeds were a carnivorous jungle. The player has to navigate a jungle filled with Venus man traps. This isn't as much an adventure seed as a combat based necessity in order to enter the EPA in the first place. Hologram War The player can encounter some of the custodial holograms that still fill the EPA corridors. They were mostly used as tour guides while the EPA was still in operation, but ever since the big silence slash great static, Following the Big Flash, they have become somewhat warped in their duties. They have taken the bureaucratic mentality to a lethal extreme, imposing regulation and regulation upon each other until they have become gridlocked in their duties and can no longer function. The heads of each division are currently arguing ad nauseum in one of the EPA conference rooms because the presence of a powerful magnetic field that keeps erasing their short-term memories. They keep repeating the same argument every five minutes, forget everything they say, then repeat it again. Only by fixing the problem with the magnetic coils, interrupting the conversation, and ordering them to stop, can the player stop the gridlock. Holograms can only be destroyed by an EMP grenade, or by stealing or destroying the EPA power core in sub-level yellow. Gas-filled level. One of the levels is filled with poisonous gas. If the player wanders around this level, he will take considerable damage every round until he leaves or dies. A player can either make brief hops onto the level to steal things from the labs there, or else find an oxygen mask hidden on one of the lower levels that allows him to breathe freely as long as he has it in one of his two hands. Ventilation Horror In order to get access to the main EPA complex, the player has to navigate a series of ventilation shafts where he can only use small weapons against the inhabitants of the ventilation shaft. Giant mantises, small scorpions, and the occasional man-eating plant. A gas-filled level would have been a novel experience in Fallout 2, and I absolutely love the hologram war, where they have deteriorated over time or are stuck in a loop due to a strong magnetic field messing with their memory. It is really interesting to think, though, that this hologram idea germinated for years and may have resulted in the holograms that we saw in Dead Money. Other seeds were Static zzzz. The player discovers one malfunctioning hologram that speaks only in static, like a fast food drive through speaker. If the player repairs the hologram's projector or slows down his speech, he can learn some important codes or other information. Mr. Kemi The player discovers a small appliance in one lab, Mr. Kemi, that takes various raw materials, plants, beer, condoms, chemicals, garbage, scorpion tails, and turns them into various pharmaceuticals like Radex, Mentats, Rataway, and so on. The player can experiment with the machine to create certain drugs or bizarre substances. Characters with a high intelligence, luck, or a high doctor or science skill can create special drugs that no other character can. Mr. Kemi always speaks in exclamation marks. The Brave Little Toaster in one of the abandoned kitchens in the EPA is a small, intelligent toaster with an IQ of 6,000. All of its brain power is focused towards convincing humans to make toast. Yes, I know it's a pop culture reference. Surprised? Sue me. Dialogue with it will be somewhat one-sided, as the player will ask it a question, and it will respond with some question about whether the player will like toast or waffles. While the toaster seems like just an incidental piece of strangeness, the toaster does happen to mention in its dialogue almost in passing, that it is broken and can't access everything it needs to in order to successfully make toast. If the player repairs it, then the toaster can provide him with the following, the secret code for the vault in one of the new Reno casinos, which is otherwise near unopenable, some secret codes for jinxing the slot machines out of their cash, and some other bonus items. ABACAB -B. One of the computers in the EPA mentions a simple cure for epilepsy. Apparently, by repeating a series of letters with the proper inflections, a listener can be cured of either autism or epilepsy. If the player discovers this and goes to New Reno and says the code phrase to the barking man, who didn't make it into the game so I put him in Planescape Torment, then he will be cured and give the player a minor reward, in addition to the minor experience award. No news of a thaw. 
The player may discover some hibernation cells in the lower levels of the EPA, and depending on what type of character he is, combat, stealth, or diplomatic, he can free one of these hibernating humans that have been preserved since the Great Silence. I am intrigued by the last one, thawing out a human who has been frozen for centuries, but at the same time, why is the EPA freezing people? Also, the toaster sounds like a funny and unique experience, and maybe the toaster we saw in Old World Blues is a much evolved vestige of the toaster idea. However, it seems like too much to have a crazy toaster, shorting holograms, poisonous gas, jungles, and man-eating plants, along with some frozen people, all in what was an old government agency focused on protecting the environment. The primary characters would have been Hologram 00000, Director of Science, a brilliant hologram that can't express himself properly. An electrical short has damaged his vocal abilities, and now he can only communicate through displaying binary numbers. A character with a high science or intelligence can read the binary codes, decipher what he is saying, and fix him. Hologram 10001, Director of Security a gung-ho marine hologram who peppers his speech with a lot of crude German phrases. He believes that everything in the complex should be killed, and then the EPA allowed to reboot. Fortunately, he can no longer command any of the robots. All the weapon defenses have run out of ammo, and all he can really do is bluster about how he would like to destroy everything if he was in charge. If the player performs some tasks for this director, they can get access to the security locker rooms, which hold some old ammo, weapons, and some armor. Hologram 12001, Director of Operations, a weaselly, nervous-smiled male hologram. Only characters with a high intelligence can make out what the hell he is saying since he uses so much double talk. Nothing can be gotten out of this director since he has no authority over anything. Hologram 10031, Director of Ground Maintenance. A frustrated hologram who is in charge of all the ground maintenance at the EPA. The fact he has no physical body and none of the robots do anything, he says, has forced him to operate at 100% inefficiency for the last few decades. The other directors always bring this up whenever they can. If the player fixes the robots or takes care of some of the gardening and landscaping problems around the EPA, killing the lethal plants, the director will hire them, allowing them access to the EPA medical cabinet and storage shed, which contains new seeds, chemicals, herbs, and various insecticides and weed killers. Hologram 40011, Director of Public Relations. This sexy sounding, yet somehow prim and proper at the same time, Hologram is in charge of all the tours and press releases. Her syrupy sweet attitude and her constant stream of press releases gets annoying really fast. Nonetheless, the player cannot get to certain areas of the EPA complex without her. There are some portions of the complex that will only open if she leads the way, mostly the museums and petting zoo. Characters with a high diplomatic skill can get much more out of her than other characters. I like the personalities and quirks that each of the holograms were supposed to receive, and I think the EPA with the holograms and plant slash nature stuff would have been the perfect amount of unique memorable, and interesting that we all look for in a Fallout game. Secondary Characters There are no secondary characters. It's all or nothing in the cutthroat world of the EPA. And that, brothers and sisters, is where we will leave off for the time being. We went through roughly half the content in this giant installment, and Gray has committed to help me round out this installment in the next video. And again, huge thanks to him, especially because he had the unfortunate task of translating a lot of those questions into English. Again, check out his channel, links in the description. Unfortunately for normal people, and fortunately for all you masochists, the video is actually not done. I have my comment highlight where I go over and react to some comments left on my last two videos. The video that covers the rest of the T-Series power armor, and the video about why the synth creation process is a nightmare. First, I want to thank my patrons that go above and beyond to make sure my fridge is stocked with fancy lads so I can keep churning out content. Adam will reward you. First, before I get to the comments on the Power Armor video, for reasons not even Adam can explain, YouTube decided to demonetize that video. I have no idea why, and the appeal was denied, although it's 60% slow panning shots of Power Armor 
and the rest are me completing quests in Fallout 4 or 76. To be completely honest, I was pretty bummed about how it all shook out, and will likely be posting a video soon about YouTube shenanigans. Anyway, there were still some great comments. Tony Stank and several others made a great point when considering what the extra equipment on the back of the NCR salvage power armor could be. It could be makeshift climate control and life support systems to help make the armor operable in the Mojave heat or irradiated areas. Other points were brought up, like how there is no indication that the generator itself was stripped out, and that could still be powering all the systems not associated with movement. That is definitely a possibility, but we also need to square the potential presence of any electrical systems with the fact that the armor is no longer impacted by electrical type weapons like normal power armor. I want to make a generalized comment towards this big thread that devolved into an argument about conflicts with in-game loading screens, established lore, and in-game stats. My conclusion at the end of the video was not to take a stance whether one game was right or wrong, because that can be up to some interpretation, but rather to show how much confusion is generated when these things don't align. I get it. These games are huge and there are a lot of moving parts, but these arguments are a direct consequence of imprecise speech and not coordinating in-game statements with loading screens and with in-game stats. That is where I would like to see improvement on the part of Bethesda. A few of you mentioned reading somewhere that the Brotherhood in Fallout 3 found a stash of T-45 power armor, and that is a big reason why they use exclusively T-45. But no amount of research on my end could dig anything up. Seriously, I'm issuing a bounty to find the source if it exists. I don't know what I'll give you, but I'm sure we can work something out. Paladin Johnson brought up an interesting point that the T-45 armor on the Future Weapons Today magazine in Fallout New Vegas seems to show a different kind of T-45, and some believe it to be Tesla armor. I am a bit skeptical myself, only because the resolution is so low. I see some small bumps on the pauldrons, but I think those might just be pixelated artifacts. I could be wrong, but I don't see any large prominent bulb-like objects like we see with the other Tesla armors. But I would absolutely love to have a Tesla version of T-45. A few people like Silver John brought up a good point when thinking about why Lion's Brotherhood was outfitted with T-45. Since T-45 in the later games is much easier to repair with more common materials, it might make sense that they were sent out from the get-go with a bunch of T-45. It might make sense that they were sent out from the get-go with a bunch of T-45 that the West Coast Brotherhood otherwise would have just kept in reserve since they have a preference for the superior T-51. As to the Brotherhood deliberately equipping Lions and his group with inferior tech because they didn't like Owens, I don't know about that. Owen didn't start going soft, as some Brotherhood members say, until after the scourge in the pit, and after seeing the desperate plight of the Wastelanders in the remains of DC. Everything seems to indicate that he was a straight shooting paladin right before being tasked with the mission to go east. Brothers of Nod got me with this comment after he said he always wanted to hear an exchange between Sergeant Dornan from Fallout 2 and the prototype medic power armor. Give the armor an expanded voice library and that stuff would be gold. On to the video about the synth process. I hope that everyone picked up that it was just a fun video with some lore and provocative thoughts. I do not hate Fallout 4, I am just a sarcastic b****, and doing a video with some levity was cathartic after the disappointment of YouTube striking my previous video. I know it's slightly out of character for me, but I needed this, and wanted to make at least a few of you crack a smile. I was really impressed with the number of insightful comments related to the process though. Many like World War Collector here, brought up some really great ideas like the use of stem cells that could create the tissue or organs at a rapid rate. We truly have no idea exactly how FEV helped the Institute create synthetic organics, but stem cells really are some of the most logical answers out there. Some similar thoughts about individual cells reforming due to so-called memory, like some metal materials seem to be able to do, are also valid. Also, yes, I read neuroelectrical in my little render window too quickly, and thought it said neurological. That is my bad. 
Several of you, like Tubi Ular, talked about the similarities between Westworld and Fallout 4 in terms of how synths are made. I would not be surprised at all if there was some level of inspiration there, especially seeing as the Westworld producers, Lisa Joy and Jonathan Nolan, will be producing the new and upcoming Fallout TV show. I am also a big fan of Christopher Nolan films, the brother of Jonathan, and who has collaborated with his brother on many of his projects. Fallout being made as a TV show with a Nolan brother as a producer gives me so much to be excited about, but I have to temper my expectations or it will be the mother of all letdowns if it doesn't end up being that good. NodNuke45's comment agrees with my sentiment as well. I pointed out the sillier elements of the synth creation process and had some fun, but at the end of the day, I am glad that they showed us the process and it was done in a way that lets you get up close and personal rather than being off in the distance. I do have to say though, this concept art looks amazing for the synth creation process. And look, they even have full body PPE. And I want to bring up this comment from Gecko. The fact that the Institute can do all this, but can't cure Sean. Yep, I got nothing else to say about that. So the sermon comes to a close. As always, I would love to hear your thoughts, either here in the comments where your comment could be featured in a future video, or in my Discord server, where we like to talk about this stuff with fellow fans. You can also support me in a small way on Patreon if you are so inclined. And thanks again to Gray for his help, and Chris for letting me appropriate his likeness. Oh, and uh, Chris, have some rat away. You're looking a little worse for wear. Let Adam guide your paths, brothers and sisters. Take care of yourselves, and I will see you soon.